Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn in our sophomore hymnals now to page 567 and following the Mulberger um, essay, What Makes a Degas a Degas. Uh, we are, of course, in Unit 3 where we are working nonfiction. I want to go back to page 557 really quickly. Let's make sure you have this in your notes at 2B, our rhetorical level of annotative work. We're working with analytical essays here, interpretive essays as well. An analytical essay, again, a brief work of nonfiction in which the writer explores an idea or claim by breaking it into parts. And then in an interpretive essay, the writer offers a view of the meaning or significance of an issue or gen of general interest. By the way, we're going to see this in, this in this essay we're about to play around with. The appeals, make sure these are listed at, in, in, your, uh, in your annotations at 2B. We have four appeals potentially that can be utilized. One, the appeal to authority, calls upon the opinions of experts or other respected people. Appeals two, to reason, calls upon logic. Three, appeals to emotion, calls upon feelings like fear, sympathy, pride. Finally, appeals to shared values or calls upon the beliefs shared by many about what is good, right, or fair. We're going to be evaluating the level of persuasion, as we see on 557, differentiating fact from opinion by using the fact-opinion chart. Okay? Let's go now to page 566 and remind ourselves of that vocabulary we want to prep for. 567, Richard Mulberger, uh, let's uh, say a few things about him. Born in 1938 in New Jersey, has spent more than 35 years as an art critic and museum administrator. During the 1990s, he was vice director in charge of education at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, one of the foremost art museums in the world. While at the Met, uh, Met Art uh, Museum of Art, Mulberger began producing a series of books that made the works of famous artists accessible to the average viewer. The series includes What Makes a Degas a Degas, the, the essay we're about to study, from which this selection is taken and similarly titled books of Van Gogh, Monet, and others. Uh, Mulberger served as the director of the Museum of Fine Art in Springfield, Massachusetts. The background for this essay, 567, uh, Degas and Impressionism, in the 1860s, a group of French painters, known as the Impressionists, shocked the art world, abandoning strict forms. They used short, dabbed brush strokes to capture fleeting impressions of color and light. Their work had a great impact on Edgar Degas, um, 1834 to 1917. At the same time as Richard Mulberger explains in his essay, Degas, Degas introduced his own innovative style. So when we turn to this essay now, we're going we're gonna to listen and watch how Mulberger will analyze the painting style of Degas and point out the techniques he used to bring intimacy and the illusion of reality to his work. By the way, there's an example for you um, uh, on page 568 of a Degas. I hope, after you finish with this, that you'll Google image uh, um, d just the name Degas and just look at all of the amazing paintings if you're not familiar with how this guy painted. Let's go ahead now, pay attention. Not a very long essay, but let's really pay attention to the structure of this essay, the way in which uh, um, our author is able to, to um, at least create in us a sense of curiosity or wonder. We said that's what all great, all great writers do. Let's watch how it happens in this essay. What makes a Degas a Degas? By Richard Milberger. Dancers, pink and green. Degas' famous ballet paintings witness his enthusiasm for dance and his intimacy with the private backstage areas of the Paris Opéra, the huge complex where the ballet made its home. He was equally familiar with the theater's more public boxes and stalls where he watched many performances. During his lifetime, he produced about 1,500 drawings, prints, pastels, and oil paintings with ballet themes. In Dancers Pink and Green, each ballerina is caught in a characteristic pose as she waits to go on the stage. One stretches and flexes her foot. Another secures her hair, while a third is almost hidden. The fourth dancer, who looks at her shoulder strap as she adjusts it, holds a pose that was a favorite of the artist and one he used in many paintings. An upright beam separates her from the fifth ballerina, who also turns her head, but in the opposite direction, full of anticipation. Above her, in the distance, are the box seats, which Degas simplified into a stack of six red and orange verticals along the edge of the canvas. The vertical beam the ballerina is touching extends to the top and the bottom of the painting. 
the multicolored vertical shapes behind the dancers represent a large painted landscape used as a backdrop for one of the dances. It will provide an immaterial dream world quality to the performance as it does to the painting. Subscribers to the opera. Let's pause for just a moment and point out. All, 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 all we want to say is notice the painting on three on five sixty eight, and notice all that has been done to this point is just simply describe in words what you're looking at there in the painting. Is that right? So notice all all he's doing is just telling you what it is that you're looking at. Now, question: Why do I need this information? Why can't I just look at the painting? The answer is obvious. There's things you may not see that an art critic is going to point out to you. That's kind of fascinating. And all of a sudden notice the juxtaposition of the two art forms. You have the painting, you have the words about the painting, and all of a sudden you're able to appreciate both of these in new and innovative ways, which is really cool. Let's go ahead now and continue. We'll finish the essay, hear what he has to say. Uh, we're allowed backstage in the theater, and some took advantage of this access to pester dancers. On the far side of the tall wood column is the partial silhouette of a large man in a top hat. He seems to be trying to keep out of the way, but his protruding profile overlaps a ballerina. None of the dancers pay attention to him. They also ignore one another, for this scene represents the tense moments just before the curtain rises. Degas discovered that with oil paints, he could achieve the same fresh feeling conveyed with pastels. Although this painting took the same amount of time to finish as many of his others, and was designed and executed in his studio, Degas wanted to make it look as though it had been executed quickly, backstage. To do this, he imitated the marks of a charcoal pencil with his brush, making narrow black lines that edged the dancers' bodies and costumes. Next, he used his own innovation of simulating the matte finish of pastels by taking the sheen out of oil paint, then filling in the sketchy charcoal outlines of his figures with a limited range of colors. The colors he used for the dancers extend to the floor and the background. The technique gives the impression that he applied the colors hastily while standing in the wings watching the dancers get ready. The results of Degas' experiments could have been executed much more quickly had he used pastels instead of oils. What Degas wanted, however, was to make paint look spontaneous. This was part of his lifelong quest, to make viewers feel that they were right there beside him. All right, let's pause for a moment, and we'll finish with his observations here. Notice the process. Did you see this? Notice he's telling us on page 569, first this, next this. He describes the composition, how Degas created this image that you're looking at, and the reasons he chose to work with oils, pastels, etc. Notice the goal at, on page 570. He says the result of these experiments could have been executed much more quickly had he used pastels beside, instead of oils. What Degas wanted, however, was to make paint look spontaneous. The Impressionist School. To make paint look spontaneous, this was part of his lifelong quest. And what was that quest? To make viewers feel that they were right there beside him. We'll now take a look at a second offer and play the same game again. Carriage at the Races Paul Valpinson was Degas' best friend in school and remained close to the artist all his life. Degas was a frequent visitor to his country house in Normandy, the northwest region of France, a long journey from Paris. Degas thought that the Normandy countryside was exactly like England, and the beautiful horse farms there inspired him to paint equestrian subjects. During a visit in 1869, however, Degas found horses secondary to Paul Valpinson's infant son, Henri. This becomes apparent by looking at the painting Carriage at the Races. At first, Degas' composition seems lopsided. In one corner are the largest and darkest objects, a pair of horses and a carriage. Against the lacquered body of the carriage, the creamy white tones of the passengers stand out. They are framed by the dark colors, rather than overwhelmed by them. Degas placed a cream-colored umbrella in the middle of the painting, above some of the figures in the carriage. Near it, balanced on the back of the driver's seat, is a black bulldog. 
Paul Valpinson himself is the driver. Both Paul and the dog are gazing at the baby, who lies in the shade of the umbrella. With pink, dimpled knees, Henri, not yet a year old, sprawls on the lap of his nurse while his mother looks on. Now again, just a real quick treatment of another painting. Notice that the, the author here begins a little bit with history, just to give us a little bit of history and background to this image that you can see on 571. Notice, you can just look at the picture on 571, the painting, but then notice that with the work of our writer, we begin to see it from a completely different perspective. I'll give you one example of this. I've had sophomores that look at this picture on 571 and they did not see the bulldog. They didn't even see it. In fact, when they read about it, they didn't even see it. They were like, what are you talking about? Oh, dude, it's right there in the center of the picture. How did I not see that? You see how we are? We, don't, we look at things, but we don't actually always look at things. Let's write that down at 2A as a possible message or here or theme. We often miss what we see. Can I say that without insult? We often miss what we see. We don't actually see everything that we're looking at. Sometimes we need somebody there to kind of help us. Help us along, to help us see it for ourselves, right? All right, we're going to look now at our last image on 572, okay? Take a look at this. By the way, this will help you the next time that you ever go to an art gallery or whatever, and already you can kind of recognize there's a whole lot more to this than what I'm looking at, isn't there? You bet. Take a look. Ideas from the exotic, old and new. Degas always enjoyed looking at art. One of the thrills of his school years was being allowed to inspect the great paintings in the collection of Paul Valpinson's father. Throughout his life, the artist drew inspiration from the masterpieces in the Louvre in Paris, one of the greatest museums in the world. He also found ideas in Japanese prints. They were considered cheap, disposable souvenirs in Japan, but were treasured by artists and others in the West as highly original, fascinating works of art. Photographs, then newly invented, also suggested to Degas ways of varying his paintings. He eventually became an enthusiastic photographer himself. In Carriage at the Races, the way in which the horses and carriage are cut off recalls figures in photographs and Japanese prints. For Degas, Showing only part of a subject made his paintings more intimate, immediate, and realistic. He wanted viewers to see the scene as if they were actually there. And that, of course, is the compelling idea of great art. It somehow moves you to have a sense as if you're right there with the artist. That's true of music. That's true of visual arts. That's true of good writing as well. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. What is a major topic message theme um, here? Well, one obviously is the quest of the artist is to somehow welcome the viewer, the listener, the experiencer into the experience with the artists, giving them a new experience or seeing an old experience in a new way, we might say. We've already said things are not all they appear to be. That is a compelling insight that we want to maybe write down it to it. I've had students that read this essay that say, I guess I've never really given full appreciation for the power of the visual arts, and now I probably should. Of course, at 2B, we can point out the ways in which this is a nicely constructed example for us of the analytical and interpretive essay. Notice, he analyzes what Degas did, did this, did this, did this, and then he interprets as to why. That final line on page 572, go back and look at it. He, Degas, wanted viewers to see the scene as if they were actually there. This is an interpretation of why it is that Degas did what Degas did. By the way, the self-portrait there is a nice one for you as well, huh? The lights, the shadows that are there on the page, on the face, uh, in the image on 572. I hope that you will go to Google Image and you will take a look at other examples of Degas. And someday, maybe when you get to visit the Louvre or other great uh, museums of art, when you look at the artists and the artwork, you'll maybe come back to this essay and be reminded. Maybe you'll even go and want to look at more of the treatments of other artists after you've read this one. At 3A, what's your favorite movie text about an artist? Shows the life of the artist, the challenges of the artist, might be a musician. See, we use the word artist to mean any, right? 
If I'm, a, if I'm a musician, I'm an artist. If I'm a writer, I'm an artist. If I'm a painter, I'm an artist. A sculptor, I'm an artist. If I'm a dancer, I'm an artist. If I play sports, I'm an artist. See, all, all of these are to the attempt to create something in self-expression. What is their favorite text about that one? That talks about the significance and the importance of art. Finally, at 3B, what is your relationship to art and artists? Do you think of artists as vital? You remember in our freshman year, we said that the Greeks saw the artists as that really influential and important group of people who sat between the gods, who were of course immortal and knew a whole lot more than humans, and humans which are mortal and know nothing. And the uh, artists, the poets is what they call them, sit in between and provide that information because they are inspired by the muses. The muses, the gods, give important information to the artists who then disseminate on to normal humans to try and help us out to help us learn something. Do you think artists are important? It's often a tragedy that in the history of the world, when totalitarian states, we think back to Solzhenitsyn, that in totalitarian states, with the rise of totalitarianism, often artists are the first ones to be executed, to be put away in the gulags or the prisons. Why? Why? Why are, to, why are totalitarian dictators always so afraid of artists? You could argue, because artists are the ones that push against those totalitarian dictator types. Artists are the ones that say the world has to be a better place. To that degree, do you see yourself as an artist? Why or why not? Well, there you go. An I hope that the next time that you go and look at a work of art, you'll maybe come back to this essay. Thank you.